So may without further ado, I'll introduce our keynote speaker today, who is Dr. Brian Guy, who um, I think everybody here knows quite well. But I'll provide for a little bit of an overview of some of uh, his background in history as a formal introduction. So um, Dr. Guy is a retired from Associated Engineers. Um, he was a national practice leader um, and also vice president and general manager at Associated Environmental Consultants. Previous to that, he was president of Summit Environment Consultants for 15 years, uh, from 1994 to 2010. Uh, Brian is a hydrologist and worked as a hydrologist with the province of BC from 1980 to 1982. And from an educational perspective, graduated with his uh, PhD in water resource engineering from the University of Guelph. And uh, Brian is uh, also uh, our chair of the policy committee for the Water Stewardship Council, for those of you that are, are joining us, and uh, has recently worked closely with the board on a new uh, analysis that is going to be the subject of his talk today. So with that, uh, Brian, take it away. Okay, Nelson, thanks. So the um, Okanagan Lake regulation system you can see some of the elements of the system in the um, title slide here. Um, it needs to be modernized. And the reason is it's getting old and it's getting harder to manage, which, which, which according to my wife is, is just like me. It, it's about the same age as I am, which means that uh, it's got maybe 20 or 30 years of, uh, of, of declining health left before it's all over. So it's a good time to talk about a, a succession plan. And as N Nelson mentioned, this the presentation summarizes a report that, that uh, we prepared for, for the owners of the system, which is the province, um, on the very first step in a, in a modernization process, uh, which is identifying the knowledge gaps um, that should be filled uh, before any significant work is done to update the infrastructure or change the way it's managed. Um, and, and also scoping out the studies that are needed to fill those gaps. And, um, you know, there's a, a, a tremendous opportunity to link with the, the work that Scott was just reporting on. And I'll um, tie into that a bit uh, throughout this presentation. Um, they, they, uh, there, there's a, a really important opportunity here um, to, 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 to work closely with, uh, with the ONA and the South people on this project. Sean uh, Reimer, who's, I think Sean is on this, on in the meeting as well. Um, uh, Sean is the person uh, who is responsible for managing the, the system. And he is the one who initiated the work and he asked OBWB to do it. And then in turn, OBWB hired Associated Environmental uh, to lead it. And I was the lead investigator. Um, and this is um, um, the cover of the report. Um, of course, I didn't uh, work alone. There was a, um, a technical committee, technical advisory committee, the members of which are listed here. Each of these people knows a lot more about particular aspects of the um, Okanagan Lake Regulation System or OLRS for short. So together it was a, a very um, broad and useful uh, group. Um, it gave not only um, you know, advice and guidance, but also technical contributions in the form of like gap identification and writing and editing and, and uh, sections of the report and reviewing drafts. There were also other contributors from these organizations, but this was the, uh, the, core, the core group. Okay, so first I'll, I'll give you an outline of what the OLRS is and, and talk a bit about why it was built and also about the, 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 uh, the negative impacts that it, that it had on the river. Um, I'll also, um, talk about the two uh, uh, issues that are causing the province to recognize that it's time to make some changes to the infrastructure itself and to the way it's managed, uh, the age, which is its age and, and the changing climate. And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that are coinciding with these challenges. And then I'll give you a quick summary of the, uh, of the report okay. itself and wrap up with next steps. Before I get too far in, I just wanna start with some background. Um, so it, the, the Okanagan Lake regulation system consists of a series of uh, dams and dikes and vertical yes. top structures um, located between uh, Penticton and the head of Osoyoos Lake. And this map shows all of the main yes. Okanagan 
uh, lakes on the Okanagan River, from Vernon in the north uh, to Osoyoos Lake in the south. It also shows the Canada-US border cutting across Osoyoos Lake and the Simulkameen River uh, in yellow on the left. Because of that watershed's relevance to water levels and flows in the Okanagan River in Canada. Um, you can also see the dams on this um, map highlighted in uh, red triangles. Actually, not all those dams that are shown on the map are officially part of the OLRS. Cal Lake near Vernon, for example, has a dam on it, as you can see, but it's not officially part of the OLRS. And Zozel Dam on Osoyoos Lake uh, down near the bottom isn't either. But both are, of course, relevant to flows and levels in the uh, main stem lakes and rivers. So um, they should be included in any project to modernize the system. Um, so specifically, what it, the system consists of is three control dams on Okanagan Lake, Skaha Lake, and Basso Lake, 17 vertical drop structures, uh, drainage structures like culverts and bridges, 68 kilometers of diking, 32 kilometers of engineered river channel and three sediment basins. And its purpose is to manage lake levels in, in those three lakes, Okanagan, Skaha, and Basso, um, and, and also the flow of the Okanagan River between Penticton and Osoyoos Lake. It was built in the 50s following some high flood years in the 1940s that caused flooding not only around Okanagan Lake, but also downstream uh, along the river downstream of the lake. So flood control was the main driver. Um, but it wasn't the only driver. It, it also provided irrigation storage and navigation, but flood control was the main driver. It also wasn't the first effort to um, manage the system. The first dam on Okanagan Lake was built in 1915 to, to improve navigation between Skaha and, and the Okanagan Lakes. But in the 1950s, um, when the OLRS was built, it, that was the most significant change that had, had happened to the entire river. Um, um, so it's owned by the province, as I mentioned, operated by the Flynn Row office in Penticton. Sean is known as the water manager, and that's what his job is to, to manage and operate the system. The plan that he uses, the operating plan that he uses to guide him in the decisions that he makes, um, was developed in the 1970s following completion of the, the major Canada, British Columbia, Okanagan Basin study that was completed in 1974. And that plan, provides Sean with target lake elevations and river flows intended to control flooding, uh, but also to provide enough water in summer for irrigation and to manage for recreational interests and, and to consider the needs of uh, both resident and anatomous fish. But the flood control objectives can trump the other ones, including the fisheries objectives. So there's a little bit of background. Um, and next I'll, I'll just show you a, a few photos. Um, so you get to have an idea of what the system looks like um, all the way down between Penticton and, and Osoyoos. Um, here's the three OLRS dams starting from clockwise from the top is the Penticton Dam. And then bottom right is Okanagan Falls Dam on Skaha Lake and then McIntyre Dam on, on, on Basso Lake. And if you look at that McIntyre Dam photo, um, you will see water flowing underneath the, the, the gates. And that's because this is an old photo. And I'll tell you more about this later, but in 2009, those underflow gates were replaced uh, with overshot gates to allow fish uh, to get past. So those are the three dams. Um, and just, just a, a reminder for comparison, none of us was around in, in 1900, but this is what the outlet of Okanagan Lake looked like. Uh, where the Penticton Dam is right now, uh, and before any uh, modifications had been made to, to, uh, to, to the river. Um, these two, as I mentioned, are not OLRS dams, but they're main stem dams nonetheless, uh, and they're both relevant to the OLRS. Um, Cal Lake is the most, uh, it's the one on the right, is the most upstream valley bottom lake in, uh, valley bottom dam in the Okanagan. And that controls the flow into uh, Vernon Creek and into the north end of Okanagan Lake. And Zozel uh, Dam on the lower left uh, is in the U.S. and it's managed according to an agreement overseen by the International Associated Lake Board of Control, which is part of the IJC, uh, the International Joint Commission. Um, inflows to Soyuz Lake are, of course, strongly influenced by OLRS operational decisions made in Canada. So the operators of Zozel Dam in the US have a keen interest in, in the OLRS and, and how it's managed. Um, here is, is what the river uh, through Penticton looks like on, on Google Earth. 
Okanagan Lake is on the left and Skaha Lake is on the right. So the water is flowing from left to right. As you can see um, in the middle, across the middle, the Okanagan River is entirely confined within an engineered channel and the old meandering river and its floodplain are now underneath the city of Penticton. Um, if you look closely, you can uh, just barely see remnants of the old river channel uh, down near the airport, uh, just upstream of Skaha Lake on both sides of the, uh, the engineered channel. Um, and a couple of ground-based photos in this section of the river. The left one was taken from the Penticton Dam looking downstream in June 2017. That's right near the height of the, the peak outflow uh, from the lake uh, in that year, 2017, which was a record year. And the right hand photo was taken, um, well, I took it last Wednesday, uh, uh, looking up from the highway bridge at Skaha, Skaha Lake, um, up, 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 up river looking upstream. Doesn't, doesn't really look much like a real river anymore, does it? Um, here is the section um, south of OK Falls. So between OK Falls and, 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 and Basso. Um, this photo is looking north and you can see it's channelized and diked on, on both sides. So this is just south of Skaha Lake, south of OK Falls. Um, and here's a few um, ground-based photos in this area. The upper left is the OK Falls Dam again, and the upper right and lower left are two of the vertical drop structures uh, that are found in this area. There's four of them in this section of the river, and, and there's a, this is two of, the, two of them. Um, and in the lower right is a photo looking down the channel, and you can see the dike on the, on the right. Um, and a few more. Um, here again, you can see the vertical drop structures, the engineered straight channel, the dikes, the alienated floodplain, and the loss of, of riparian vegetation. So that was between Skaha and Vaso. So here's the section from McIntyre Dam uh, down to Oliver, which is a distance, a valley distance of about 10, about 10 kilometers. <clears throat> um, the river is natural from McIntyre Dam to the Highway 97 crossing, which is about three kilometers uh, downstream of McIntyre. And then it's diked on, on one side uh, for a couple more kilometers. And then it's diked on both sides all the way to Oliver. So it's natural and then partly natural and then diked uh, all the way to Oliver. Um, and a few photos from this particular section, clockwise from the upper left, that's the, the top one on the left. Upper left is the natural section just south of McIntyre Dam. Um, on the upper right is a semi-natural section, which is it's just diked on one side here. Uh, south of the highway crossing, looking downstream. Um, on the lower left is a, a cutoff meander on the west side of the dike, uh, south of the Highway 97 crossing. And the lower right is again, south of the Highway 97 crossing, just showing farmland uh, on, the, on the floodplain west of the dike uh, with the river on the right-hand side of the dike in this photo. Um, another photo in the semi-natural section north of Oliver and on the right, this is a photograph of the first um, project site that the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative tackled. Um, it's just north of Oliver looking upstream. Um, um, on the left is a cutoff, is a meander bend in the river that was cut off by the dike. Um, and um, um, so this project has reconnected that old meander bend. I'll show you some more on this in a bit. But that's all in the section from McIntyre to Oliver. So from Oliver down to Asoyas, um, this is what it looks like on, again on, on, uh, on, on Google Earth. So the valley length here from Oliver to Asoyas Lake is about 15 kilometers. Oliver uh, is on the left and the river is flowing left to right again. Um, here you can see that it is entirely confined along this entire uh, section by, by dikes on, on both sides. Um, this is another view of the lowest seven or eight kilometers of the river up right upstream of Basoyas Lake. So it's the lower half of the valley that, uh, between Oliver and the lake. And here you can clearly see the, uh, the pattern of the old river channel and, and the extent of its, uh, of its floodplain. Um, a couple more aerial photos of the lower river uh, down near Basoyas Lake um, um, and a couple more. So in the section from Vaso to Basoyas, the river uh, used to be 54 kilometers long, but with all this straightening and diking, it's uh, lost about half its length. It's now only 25 and a half kilometers long. 
but because it's shorter, the, the slope is about double what it was before it was channelized. And that's why um, there are 13 of these vertical drop structures in this section to take out that, that, that slope. Um, but it isn't only the river channel itself that's been impacted uh, in this section. The floodplain has been impacted um, uh, as, as well. The wetland area has been reduced from 81 hectares down to 10 hectares. 90% of the, of the riparian vegetation is gone. And, and the width of the floodplain has been reduced from an average uh, before it was channelized of 400 meters to only 45 meters uh, today. So some serious, um, um, some serious alterations and impacts on the, on the floodplain and, and of course all the biological processes that uh, occur in the floodplain. Here's a few ground-based photos um, in this section from Oliver to Asoya, starting with uh, four photos right here from just south of Oliver. Near, near Oliver, there's lots of residential, um, industrial, commercial, and agricultural activity going on in the floodplain. And here's a few, a few photos just, for, uh, just to illustrate that. Um, there's also some beautiful meanders in this area that have been cut off by, by the dikes. And here's a couple of photos of those. Um, and here is a collage of uh, vertical drop structures, uh, four of the 13 in this area of the river. Um, yeah, this is looking south um, along the west side dike, about five kilometers upstream of the Soyuz Lake. And the right hand photo is looking upstream in, in north in, the, in about the same area, somewhere around the same area. Um, here is what you see uh, looking south uh, if you're standing on a bridge or a drop structure in this lower river, it's a, the channel is dead straight, uh, unnatural, featureless, engineered, and, and diked on both sides. So uh, in summary, um, the river was channelized primarily to control flooding, and it has certainly done, done that. Um, it's also operated to uh, provide irrigation and other benefits. And um, I think we've come to expect and to rely on the various benefits that the system provides and maybe become a little bit complacent about those benefits. Um, I, I doubt that modern Valley residents understand how the lake level varied before there was any ability to control the level of the lake or the, the lakes or to control the outflow from the lake. But I suspect there is, isn't a widespread uh, understanding of just how significant the, the flood control and irrigation and other benefits are. And, and just as these photos show, the, 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 the OLRS also significantly impacted the river and its floodplain. And, and once again, I doubt that there is a really widespread understanding of what was there before or what's been lost. So um, some things have changed since the 1950s, since the system was built. Um, first of all, um, it, there is now an operating plan. Um, it was designed in the 1970s, uh, following the, that, the big Okanagan Basin study, and it was formally adopted in, in 1982. So this, this is the plan still in use today that Sean uses, and it attempts to meet multiple objectives, as I mentioned before, but flood control still, still dominates. Um, now, in addition, a lot of work has been done to reverse some of the, the river and floodplain impacts, and much of it has been led by the ONA, um, along with strong collaboration from other, other governments. Um, the most recent work began in about 1997, and the ONA really got it kickstarted by hosting a workshop um, between the federal and provincial governments and, and ONA. And one of the first restoration initiatives um, of the group that formed out of this workshop was a project to develop a fisheries model that could predict the outcomes of, of flow management decisions uh, on fish in order to improve the management of the system to benefit fish. And the result of that was the uh, fish water management tools decision support system that, that's um, shortened here to FWMT. And so that um, 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 decision support system, it models the effects of flow management now, not only um, on, on fish, but on irrigators and recreation interests too. So that model is run basically in real time to help Sean make the best operational decision. Um, the next uh, item here is that fish uh, passage, is about fish passage. So all three OLRS dams have been modified now to permit 
fish passage. In the case of Skaha and Penticton, um, these dams had been built with fish ladders um, in the 50s, but they'd never been used. So really, they just needed to be activated. Um, um, the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative, um, or uh, ORI, uh, as it's shortened to, O-R-R-I, um, that ha ha project has renaturalized and restored portions of the river in, um, in three um, main areas. One is just upstream of Oliver, that I referred to that earlier, and I'll show you another photo of it later. Um, in the Penticton Channel, and then in the section between OK Falls and, 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 and Vassal Lake. Um, and that latest project is underway now. And finally, to support all of these restoration efforts, um, a fish hatchery was built in Penticton in 2014, and it's operated by the, by the ONA. And, and before I leave the slide, here's an important point. None of these restoration efforts have impeded the ability to control flooding, the main objective of the OLRS. And in fact, the fish water management tools, um, this decision support system has improved the province's ability to provide the full range of benefits that the system was intended to provide. Um, let me just show you quickly what this fish water management tools output model output looks like. This is an example taken from a model run that, that Sean did on Mar May the 26th. Um, and that's where the black lake level trace at the bottom uh, changes to blue. So black is in the past and blue is in the future. And this is, this is running from last October right out to this September, 2021. And it shows the impact of a proposed, like a scenario, a proposed future lake level plan, but that's the blue part of the lake level trace on a variety of, 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 of receptors uh, and listed across the, uh, the top. So flood control around the lake, uh, domestic water supply intakes, agricultural intakes around the lake, navigation, the Rocky Mountain Ridge Mussel and, and Kokanee. And it uses a very nice visual um, red, yellow, uh, green color scheme to highlight the outcomes of each of these forward looking model runs and help choose an optimal scenario to, to meet as many of these objectives as possible. So that's what fish water management tool does. It really helps Sean uh, uh, meet multiple objectives. Uh, back to McIntyre Dam. Here, the first photo of McIntyre I showed you was the old one with underflow gates. So in 2009, it, it was modified to provide fish passage. That dam was built in 1954 to create a head pond for the big Oliver Irrigation Canal that supplies water to a lot of the irrigated land in the South Okanagan. And that's the canal you can see on the right on the photo. Um, the, those upstream, those uh, underflow gates blocked upstream passage, which is kind of ironic because anadromous fish um, could get upstream past all nine Columbia River dams that are downstream of here um, um, with, these are massive dams with heights ranging from you know 130 feet minimum up to 260 feet. Um, but they all have fish uh, ladders and they could get past them. And then they got stopped at this little dam. Um, so in 09, they replaced those gates with overshot gates along with a Newbury riffle um, downstream to provide a good pond for the fish to jump out of and up and over the gates. And um, um, Here's a, a couple more views from closer to, 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 the new, to the new dam. So you can see the overshot gates now and how they work in the upper left. And on the right, you can see fish actually getting through the gates, jumping over. Doesn't look like they're having good success right there, but um, uh, they are, they can, they can get past that, that um, they can get past that, that dam now, no problem. Um, and as I mentioned before, the other two OLRS dams, um, the one at Del Cay Falls and the one at Penticton, uh, they were built with fish ladders, and you can see these these two dams, Cal, um, um, uh, sorry, OK Falls on the left and Penticton on the right. Those openings on the extreme far far left are the fish ladders, and um, uh, so in 2013, the the fish ladder uh, at OK Falls Dam was um, was activated, and in it was 2019, just last year, a year before that the fish ladder at Penticton was activated. So now the fish, the anadromous returning salmon can get access to their entire historic range. I, I, I took these photos last Friday and um, you can see water flowing through these fish ladders uh, right now. So they are working. Um, so the ORI project, another quick word on the ORI project, it was initiated back in 2000 
uh, with the goal of returning portions of the, the channelized river back to more natural conditions. And um, it's a collaboration between ONA and federal, provincial and local governments. Um, I mentioned already the three main areas, uh, Oliver Penticton and OK Falls. Um, here's a photo um, of this Oliver section uh, looking upstream that mainly involved setting back the west side uh, dike. Um, the dike used to run right through the center of, of, the, of this, this photo. This is looking north, so the river is flowing from the upper right down to the lower left. And so it mainly involves setting back the dike on the west side and reactivating those two meander bends that had been cut off by, by the dike. But, but, the, but there was more to it than that. And, and this next slide will give you a sense of how many other different uh, components there were to that project down near, near Oliver. So there's, it was a, a, you know, a seven, six, seven um, different uh, components to that, uh, to that project. And uh, this is a slide that I took from a 2017 presentation uh, by Kim Hyatt. Kim, Kim was a, a, a true friend uh, of the Okanagan. He, he uh, for many, many years, Kim was a, a real champion for Okanagan fisheries and river restoration. And uh, he contributed not only his scientific expertise to all these restoration projects, but he, he, was a, he, he was a true leader and he contributed his strong, strong leadership to get these projects uh, uh, going. And this slide from Kim um, uh, demonstrates the dramatic results achieved through these initiatives, just, high, just using one metric, which is the number of fish passing Wells Dam upstream, back, heading back upriver to spawn. Wells Dam is the most upstream dam on the Columbia below the Okanagan, uh, below the Okanagan River confluence with the Columbia. The data here only extends to 2014, but um, the numbers since then have continued strong. You can see the key points that Kim highlighted on this slide, that ONA workshop in 97 that I mentioned, and um, a big change in about 2008 when some of the impacts of these restoration projects started to be felt. Up to 19, up to 2007, the average, the average number there was, was 35,000 fish. But from 2014 to 2020, that average has been 194,000 fish. Huge improvements, about six times higher. And remember that none of these positive results for Okanagan sockeye or Okanagan anadromous fish in general have been achieved at the expense of achieving other OLRS objectives. And also remember that this, all this river restoration initiative started in 1997 at a meeting that the ONA hosted. And since then, ONA has been leading this impressive restoration effort. So, you know, it makes you wonder if it would be possible to expand this restoration effort for even bigger ecosystem benefits um, without impacting the other benefits provided by the system and perhaps even to contribute to achieving some of them like flood control by reactivating some of those, more of those former meander bends and moving back some dikes allowing the river to convey high flows and, and more room to, 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 to maneuver and periodically replenish uh, the floodplain like it used to. All right, let's shift gears from the ORLRS and, and, and its benefits and impacts to the current situation facing the province as owners of the system. There's two key issues. Uh, one is it's the, 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 the infrastructure is about 65 years old, uh, so it's, it's getting on. Uh, two, because of changing hydrologic or changing, um, uh, yeah, hydrologic conditions related to a progressively changing climate, John is seeing that it's getting increasingly challenging to operate the system within the constraints provided in the operating plan to meet those constraints while continuing to provide flood control and other benefits. So let's talk a little bit about those two drivers for change, starting with the changing climate. Now, to begin with, and as a brief reminder, you're all familiar with this idea. Here's a slide that demonstrates how global average temperatures have changed since 1980. All of the hottest years on record around the world have occurred since 1998. And these changes in air temperature are leading to changes in precipitation and changes to the hydrologic cycle all around the world, including here, including here at home. Um, Sean has begun to notice these hydrologic changes. Spring runoff is coming off earlier. Conditions are, are becoming more variable and difficult to predict. 
We used to see flood years and drought years occurring in different years, but recently we've seen both floods and droughts in, in the same years, like 2017. That was a, was a good example of that. Uh, we saw flooding in the spring, followed by drought and fires in the summer. In the spring, the winter preceding this, that spring had only 80% of the normal snowpack. It's, it's normally snow that drives you know, the flood situation. In the winter of 2017, the snowpack was 80% of normal until, until March, until early March. And then we had a, a really wet spring and Okanagan Lake rose to 27, 20 centimeters above the 200 year return period water level to its highest level ever. And it peaked early. It peaked on June the 8th, about two weeks earlier than normal. And then for three months, it hardly rained a drop. And we saw droughts and fires in mid and late summer. So Sean is noticing that these weather changes are making it progressively harder to manage the system and, and provide those benefits. Um, and he's expecting to see these climate changes, climate driven changes continue. And it's making him increasingly concerned about whether he'll be able to continue to deliver the same level of benefits from the, uh, the OLRS. Right, so these climate trends, they, they do provide a, a, you know, a worrisome backdrop, but the real trigger that forced a hard look at, at this issue came in the form of a 2020 flood mapping report produced by Northwest Hydraulic Consultants for OBWB. Um, that uh, NHC report, and this is the um, cover of the report, um, and the many maps that they produced are available on the OBWB website. And that report showed that unless changes are made to the operating plan to allow for better flood control, future flood levels on the main stem lakes and the river are gonna be much higher than they've been in the past hundred years, thanks to the ongoing effects of climate change. And, and that high years like 2017 are gonna, are gonna become commonplace rather than rare like they are today. But changing the operating plan to provide Sean with that greater flexibility to manage high flows could or would substantially increase the fish, the, the, the risk for fish and for farmers uh, and other users of the river from the Valley Bottom Lakes and Okanagan um, River. And these issues have not yet been properly examined. Um, these next two slides were taken from the 2020 um, Northwest Hydraulics uh, report. And this one shows the lake levels, um, model lake levels on Okanagan Lake, uh, starting in 1950 at the bottom left, going out to 2100 at the far right. And these are the lake levels that are likely to result from the changing climate. And assuming that Sean continues to use the current operating plan, the orange line is the highest level that was reached in 2017, which was 20 centimeters higher than the 200 year return period event. So the key, Things that you can see on this slide are flood levels are going to likely increase in the decades ahead. 2017 level will become uh, normal or commonplace as a, as, a, as, a, as a peak flood level by about 2050. And after um, 2050, that 2017 level could be frequently um, and significantly exceeded. Uh, this one is the same analysis, but it's for the flow of Okanagan River at Oliver. And you can see the same result, higher, which is higher and higher uh, flood flows uh, in the future. Um, uh, and by the way, that report also produced maps, uh, flood maps for Okanagan Lake and other main lakes and for the river, um, in, which include the effects of climate change um, out to the middle of the century. And they show significantly higher flood levels um, uh, design flood levels and, and greater, much greater horizontal extents of flooding than what we see today. So clearly something needs to be done. At the very least, the operating plan needs to be modified to deal with higher flood levels. But as I mentioned, first we have to study how the additional ability to manage floods uh, could, would, would affect the risks to fish and, and irrigators and others in, uh, in late summer. So that is the the, the, that, that's the first driver, the big cl climate change driver. Let's look at the second one, uh, which is the age and condition of the, of the infrastructure itself. About every 10 years, um, uh, Flinro hires external engineering experts to take a good look at all, the, all of this uh, infrastructure. And here's the cover of the latest report on the vertical drop structures that was completed for the province in, uh, in 2019. Um, and this is the latest report on the Okanagan Lake Dam that was completed in late 2018 and a quote from that report. 
there are extreme deficiencies in the ability of the dam and downstream OLRS infrastructure to pass an IDF exceeding a one in 200 year frequency of occurrence. An IDF is an inflow design flood. So even now, neglecting for the moment the predictions of higher flood levels in the future, even now the, the OLRS is deficient. And, um, and furthermore, despite the fact that, they, that, that Flinro examines each of the, of the dams and all the other components about every 10 years, you know, they identify issues and they do the required repairs and maintenance. Um, but despite all that, and despite its advanced stage, the province still doesn't ha have a, a really solid idea about how long these assets are gonna last or, or hey, when they'll need major upgrading or replacement or what that will cost. Hey, Brian? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanna add a quick note of a context to particularly this slide. Um, in order to pass, uh, you know, it's something that we're struggling with in terms of our dam safety review uh, a little bit, uh, because in order to actually uh, meet our own um, sort of standards uh, for this kind of thing, when it talks about a deficiency, um, our spillway on Okanagan Lake Dam would have to be the same size as Okanagan Lake Dam. Uh, in order for us to meet the freeboard requirements, uh, we would have to raise the dam up to a level and then extend uh, the dam horizontally to <laughs> the valley walls. Um, so we would be covering up the front of Penticton and then going all the way across to the west, uh, you know, across Highway 97 and, and, and there. So uh, it's quite, it's recognized that in terms of uh, what this particular dam is, um, it, it, it's, it's very different and the, the, these, it's a bit of a, a round, round peg in a square hole, however you want to say it. Uh, and um, because these regulations are really meant for uh, a reservoir that's impounding water for other reasons, rather than a reservoir which was created just to basically shave the extremes off of, of, of flows. So, um, you know, it, it's something we're working through in terms of the best way to deal with it. But um, I just wanted to add a little bit of context when you talk about this particular deficiency you see there. It's, it's not something that is a, a big concern to the dam safety officers at this point. Uh, and they recognize that um, we're not going to be able to meet those standards because those standards aren't really applicable uh, because we're a little bit different uh, for this particular dam. So anyway, when I yeah. see the slide, I just have to add a little bit of context there. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. I, I, I was aware of that point that you just made. I just, I'm using this just to illustrate the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, we, 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 blood levels could be higher than they have been. And, uh, you know, we've got pressures come, there's lots of pressures on the system and, and some things need to be done to it. Yeah, and um, I just don't want everyone out there starting to do the dinner time chats about, oh my God, you know, we're way deficient and things like that. It, it's not yeah. uh, it, it, at that point by any means, but I, I get your point about in the future uh, as lake levels get higher, um, it, you know, it, it's obviously more concerning, yes. Yeah, okay, thanks, John. Okay, um, that's uh, enough about the challenges. Um, um, what about the opportunities? Um, uh, well, first of all, there's the opportunity to, to modify the system to improve its resilience to the change of climate, um, which, which is, you know, happens to be taking place at about the right time in its life cycle. You know, it's no longer youthful. It's done its job for many decades, and, uh, but it's going to have to be modified or upgraded or replaced uh, before too long. Um, and at, at the same time, there is an opportunity for a win-win. The river was drastically changed in the 50s and, and, and despite the recent restoration work, there's still lots of opportunity to expand this work. Um, and, and, and as well, opening up the old river channel could provide um, additional overflow capacity for high flows in the future. So it's possible that river restoration could help with flood control and, and we're gonna need, um, we're likely gonna need more ability to handle big floods in the future. So it makes sense to consider expanding the restoration work to achieve not only restoration objectives, but also OLRS objectives, particularly flood control. And, 
and, and the restoration work that's been completed to date um, shows that this can be done. Um, there's also an opportunity to rebalance uh, the priorities um, to reflect modern values and processes. In, in the 50s, decisions <laughs> tended to be made in a, in a top-down fashion. Society was um, happy to rely on governments and engineers to propose and implement solutions that allowed humans to control nature. You know, negative environmental and socioeconomic impacts weren't given that much priority or as much priority. Society wasn't um, that much engaged in, in decision making, but providing solutions that focus on, on one issue without considering other values are, I think, I hope, I think today are a relic of the past. So there's an opportunity here to reimagine a system that provides multiple benefits while minimizing negative impacts. The other thing is back in the 50s, there wasn't much consultation um, with the public and certainly not with the silk people. Even in the 70s during the Okanagan Basin study um, that led to this current operating plan that we have now, there, there was consultation. Uh, consultation did take place during that, that period, but not with the silk people. Um, but you know, times have changed since then as well. And, and now there's an expectation of, 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 of broad public involvement in decision-making. Um, environmental values are, are given much more importance. And of course, there is an expectation that the silk people will be involved. Indeed, the, the ONA, um, as I've been saying, has been leading restoration and flow management efforts in the Okanagan for the last 20 years. So they will continue to be involved. And, 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 and not just the last 20 years, the silk people managed the system sustainably for thousands of years before the settlers arrived. Um, um, and, we, and more than just the ONA though, we need to genuinely engage all of, of silk society to, to learn about the past and make the best choices for the future. So we do have an opportunity right now to fundamentally examine all the historic benefits and impacts of the existing uh, Okanagan Lake regulation system and design a new system through a process that involves all of Okanagan society, including the silk people. So what should we do now? Um, this is indeed a complex and challenging situation. Um, and uh, uh, staring these challenges and opportunities in the face, Blinro is wondering what, what we should do now. What do we need to know before we can start a major effort to modernize the system? So that's why they initiated this this plan of study project. And here's the report cover again. It lays out a program of studies required to fill in the knowledge gaps before a comprehensive plan to modernize the, the system can be developed. Um, and, and here's what's under the hood inside that report cover. Uh, 13 core studies <clears throat> that fill information gaps identified through the study and four supporting studies. These are studies that will be uh, these supporting studies are studies that will be helpful to the modernization process, but not essential. Their main contribution will be to contribute to the ongoing incremental process of improving the information base that underlies uh, current operations. Um, and all of these scientific and engineering studies are integrated at the end into a plan uh, for modernizing the OLRS um, and its operating plan. And the report includes a description of a, of a broad-based community engagement program designed to solicit uh, information and ideas and provide feedback to improve um, not only the individual studies uh, themselves, but also the final uh, OLRS modernization plan. Um, this slide schematically shows the 17 technical studies and, and the final planning study uh, in which the, the plan is developed and the linkages. It indicates which studies need to proceed, which other studies and which ones can be done independently. Of course, there's no time uh, to go through this here, but it's included in the report. So if you wanted to look more closely, you could see it, you'll find it in the report. And the same goes for this, this slide. It um, provides a seven year schedule during which all this, uh, um, all this uh, work would take place. Um, uh, similar to the previous slide, there's too much information here to get into, but Again, um, it, it, you can see the schedule in the, in the report. Um, so the studies that are described in the report are grouped uh, uh, into four, uh, four categories. And I'll just run through them quickly in the next four slides. Um, the first three studies in, in this group um, link 
um, hydrologic and hydraulic work that's underway already in the Simulcamine uh, with work that's completed in the Okanagan and they fill in some gaps in the Okanagan work. The other four studies in this group are the four supporting studies that I mentioned, four, five, six, and seven. They're gonna add useful information, but the plan of study can be completed uh, without them. Um, this, the two studies here in group two look back into the past. Study eight will describe the, the um, and quantify if possible, the, the conditions before Europeans arrived. And nine will describe the history, benefits and impacts of the OLRS. Um, some of this work exists, but it will need to be done more comprehensively and put into one, one place. Um, there are seven studies in group three that are focused on, on the present and the future. They include flood and drought risk assessments and risks here, risks and hazards are driven not only by natural processes causing floods and droughts, but they're also uh, controlled or driven by the way the system is managed. So both these risk assessments will look at risks uh, under the current operating plan, as well as under different hypothetical operating plans that could be adopted to reduce those risks. Um, and they both look into the future to see what happens to these risks as the climate changes. Um, and finally, both of these risk assessments will, will, um, will cover uh, the natural environment and the built environment. Um, it includes, this group includes a study to quantify the expected lifespan of the ORLRS infrastructure um, and its replacement costs, and another one to look into what would need to be done to recover uh, any of the flood control or, or other benefits that may have been lost due to climate change uh, in, in recent years. And finally, um, um, a final study 16 that will look comprehensively at the feasibility of, of a major expansion of the restoration work that's, um, that's already been done. So those are the, the, the studies in group three. And then finally in group four describes the path forward to modernizing the ORLRS. 17 is gonna describe the relevant uh, legal, political, cultural, environmental, and social contexts for uh, that govern the work of, 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 of system mod modernization. And 18 is the study that integrates the outcomes of all the previous studies and, and develops a comprehensive climate resilient plan for modernization that reflects the values and priorities of all Okanagan society, indigenous and non-indigenous. Um, and here is where um, uh, Scott was talking about the Anaukan Week decision-making process, perhaps something like that, that, that uh, could be helpful in, in managing the planning process within the study 18. And you know the, the the that whole initiative that 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 he's describing. Um, it, uh, there's an obvious link to the the work that's required for this OLRS modernization uh, project. Um, and so, a quick summary: the the the, the presentation. The, the system is operated to provide lots of benefits, but flood control is still the dominant one. There's two big drivers for upgrading um, or replacing the, the system. One is it's getting old and two is the, is, is the climate change is making it harder to manage, to continue to provide those benefits that, that, that it was intended to provide. Something needs to be done. We can't just uh, sit still and do nothing. Um, and, and as well, that the time it was constructed, society and decision makers placed a very high value on flood control and a lower value on the environment and it negatively impacted valley bottom ecosystems. However, thanks to ONA leadership and great collaboration amongst the various levels of government, these impacts have begun to be partially mitigated without getting in the way of achieving other, other OLRS benefits and more of this restoration work is likely feasible. Society is different from what it was in the 50s and 70s. We place more value on the environment today and we have more comprehensive uh, processes for decision-making. And of course, the silt people, have been in this valley for thousands of years, we're, we're, are gonna be involved going forward. And not just the scientists at, at ONA, but youth, elders, entire communities, the full breadth of, of society. And, and finally, um, this project has, has developed a plan, a plan of study uh, to fill the knowledge gaps and develop a comprehensive plan to modernize the, um, the OLRS and the way it's managed. Uh, this final slide is what I think are the next logical steps to take to efficiently deliver this plan of study. Uh, first, determine the best approach to delivering it. So this involves dealing, uh, deciding who is gonna lead the work and, and who's gonna do the work. I expect that the owners, uh, which is the province, would provide leadership, but 
but also that the work will probably require some combination of, of government, ONA, uh, perhaps academic bodies in the private sector. Uh, some kind of leadership group should probably be convened to, to manage it. This, this would uh, you know, organize the work and, 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 and manage it. Funding needs to be, be secured. Costs have not yet been developed um, in this report because of uncertainties about the approach to the delivery and, and uncertainty about who will do the various um, aspects of the work. But once those decisions have been made, um, a cost estimate would need to be developed and that would be the basis for securing the necessary funding. And then go ahead and complete the work based on the study outlines provided in, in this report. And, if, and as well by integrating um, you know, knowledge gained through, through other ongoing initiatives like, like this Okanagan Lake Responsibility Initiative that, uh, that Scott was talking about. Um, some of this, of this work has actually begun on an ad hoc basis like the IJC work that I mentioned uh, for studies one and three. Um, the OBWB has already secured the funding for studies seven and 11, <clears throat> but, not, but none of the, um, the coordinated planning has taken place on, on organizing the, uh, the full work program. Uh, so thanks, and I'll leave you with a, um, a, uh, uh, this last slide, which is uh, for Kerry. It's a photo of big old riparian cottonwood tree. Great, great presentation, Brian. Uh, I really liked your perspective on, on, on that we can do things differently uh, going forward, that's for sure. Uh, we do have enough time to open the floor and at, to, for questions for Brian, so I'd like to do that right now. Bernie. Yeah, um, Brian, that's a, that was a great, great summary, great presentation. Um, sounds like you've thought it through really carefully. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing that report and what progress we make in the future. While you were talking, um, it reminded me of um, a meeting I attended, must have been 2007, 2008, when I was still chair of the, uh, well, just beginning my chair of Water Stewardship Council. And there was an OBWB uh, board meeting down in Penticton where the ONA uh, made a present, presentation on the ORI project, likely one of the first ones, maybe maybe Carrie was there, I can't remember to, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, but um, they had invited some of the contractors who worked on the project there. And it was really interesting listening to uh, one individual. And he said um, he was delighted to work on this restoration project that, um, you know, put the stream back into a sort of a semi-natural state because his father had worked uh, as uh, an excavator operator in uh, channelizing the river 50 years before. Mm -hmm. And he thought that this was somehow good karma for his family to be able to return uh, the system to some natural state. So that was, um, I thought, really interesting. I thought I'd share that. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the, the question I have for you, um, uh, Brian, and I'm not sure uh, whether those studies will include some of the economic um, drivers um, or, or constraints here, because my understanding is that, you know, even with the ORI project, it was really difficult to try to get the funding and to get the agreement from local landowners to actually give up their property to reoccupy the floodplain. Um, and so uh, how, how important is that in, in some of these studies? I, I'm sure it's, it's somewhere in there, but it, it has to be, you know, the sort of social economic kind of uh, dynamic that gets local people and local landowners on board with these restoration initiatives. Yeah, um, one of the studies, I think it's 16, is, is gonna take a good hard look at the feasibility uh, of, of including what it's gonna cost, what it would cost, um, including cost for land acquisition where necessary um, to, to, to do a really full scale river restoration project. Um, some, of those, some of the areas will, will be very tough, I think, and some will be easier, but that, that needs to be done. Um, the, the costs, um, the benefits um, of, of all of these, of all of these, um, um, of, of, of all of the options um, have to be looked at very, very carefully so that, uh, um, you know, an, an, um, an optimal path forward is, is chosen based on all the information that, that, that we can get. And with knowledge of the costs and the, and the, and the benefits, um, that's, that's, why, that's why the study program 
um, that's why this technical advisory committee and, 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 and me, we, that's why we thought it would take about seven years to do. It's, if it was going to be simple, if it was going to be easy, it, it wouldn't cost very much and it could be done sooner. But there's a lot of work to be done. Um, Carrie, go next. Uh, I just wanted to add to that piece. It, it is a pretty significant piece of how, because a lot of that land, not all of it, but a large portion of the land that um, was floodplain and would be needed to re-engage to make this space for flood conveyance has been um, uptaken by private properties. Well, well, there's quite a bit of a shift also um, in a number of areas that show that these areas are going to be compromised and at risk uh, in future. And there is a great potential if a, if a good plan is in place that you could make it safer for humans by moving the humans and cheaper to the project overall by moving the humans than continually restoring their homes and their basements that are going to get even more and more flooded. So I so kudos to Ryan's plan um, in the fact that, that these are a number of the considerations moving forward, because I think that that's, that's a, a real piece of our future. And then Marta and then Denise. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, and thanks, Carrie, for those are great suggestions, too. And uh, I did really like the all of the pictures. And I've been here for 15 years, and I, I never realized that we've gone from so many kilometers uh, to three, basically three kilometers <laughs> left. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's, that's it's very, like everyone in the Okanagan should know that. So um, I support sharing that story. I'm guessing there's a lot of data that's needed to fill the gaps here. I'm wondering if, if maybe I missed it, but um, obviously there's got to be links to other projects like the Okanagan Water Supply and Demand and Groundwater Surface Water Interaction. Can you spend a bit more time talking about that? Well, sure. I, I, I didn't you know, have any time in the presentation to go into the studies um, in any kind of detail, but in, in this report, which is, <clears throat> there's a hard copy of it, um, mm -hmm. It, it, it's, it, it's about a centimeter thick. <clears throat> and for each of those 18 studies, there is a, um, 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 there's, there's a study uh, scope that describes the, back, the rationale for the study, the contribution that it'll make, a whole bunch of background information, um, an overview of the study and the methods and the deliverables. Um, so yeah, e each one of these, um, each one of these 18 studies um, um, uh, in, in the report uh, describes some of the relevant background um, material. So all of that would have to be um, dug up and, and brought to bear um, on, um, on, on the work, yeah. Denise? Uh, hi, thank you, Brian. That was a really interesting uh, presentation, excellent. Um, and I'm just wondering, maybe either you or Carrie can answer this question. I'm just wondering how much of the potential floodplain restoration area will lie within the proposed national park in the south? I'll leave that one to, to, to Carrie. Um, I, I, I'm not too sure, actually. I haven't seen the final any um, boundaries. Um, uh, I am unsure, but the I, the concepts behind uh, the type of restoration that we do to balance between flood capacity and benefits to ecosystems do typically align with many parks plans. So I, I don't, it, as long as there's an overlap, I'm pretty sure we can find a middle ground um, to make it uh, a win-win for all. But I, I actually don't know how much of that overlap does exist. I, I would think this would be something that would be of great interest to the Parts Canada. I mean, I think they would really be supportive of it. So I, I don't see it as a barrier, but rather something to be encouraged. Thanks. Any other questions for Brian? Hey, Brian, when will you be able to share that report, Brian? Um, I, I I sent the final report over to Sean and, and, and Anna earlier this week. So that is really a question for Sean. Yeah, reaching for unmute. Um, and uh, so 
I've got the report. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy with it. But this is uh, of a scale that it, it has to trickle upwards through my executive. Uh, and it is in that process right now. So um, I don't unfortunately have a, a good answer for you that way. Uh, my expectation is that, you know, uh, it may be, it may be months because, uh, that kind of trickling goes pretty slowly. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping that in its entirety like this, uh, this will be publicized and, you know, uh, it'll help us, uh, get, you know, sort of some, uh, momentum into the next steps. I have a follow-up question, and um, the main reason for the um, the dams and the flow control, well, not so much the flow control structures, but the, the dams on the system was to mitigate the flooding downstream, right? You know, past Penticton and then further down in Soyuz, right? Because- Around the lake, is, around the lake and, and downstream, yeah. Yeah, well, okay. Um, so around the lake is is pretty difficult ar argument to make because the dam actually has limited capacity to to uh, dump the flow, right? And so um, mm, it, no, it, it's got more capacity than the channel downstream will allow. Yeah, no, I understand that, but um, you know when the water levels are going up in the spring freshet during high snowpack years, mm. uh, Sean always has trouble trying to dump stuff fast enough, right? Because that's a that's a choke point. Uh, he doesn't always have trouble dumping fast enough, the, the, but, but he does, one of the things that he does have trouble with is, is that the forecasts are not produced frequently enough. Um, and so that's why he sometimes has to try to play catch up. Like that's what happened in 2017. He was, he was conserving water in the lakes all through the winter until March. And then even the March forecast, March 1st for, forecast, was for about 80% of normal runoff. So he, so he kept holding it up and then it started to rain and he was caught then between a rock and a hard place. He couldn't let water out fast enough. He, yeah, he opened, yeah. opened the gates wide uh, to the point where, you know, he exceeded the design capacity of about 70 cubic meters per second. He went up to about 120 cubic meters per second um, to the point where you were getting erosion and flooding along the channel south of the dam. But still, the lake rose to higher than the 200-year level. That's because he started late, and so the reason for that was the forecasts weren't weren't weren't. First of all, they're only produced monthly. Secondly, the the winter was dry and the spring was wet, so was, so so there was a locked-in dry pattern in in the winter, and then another locked-in wet pattern in the spring. And the forecasts, the forecast frequency, fre uh, forecast update frequency, couldn't keep up with the weather changing uh, from dry to wet in the spring, basically. So he actually, what he actually did partway through the spring was override the, the, the operating plan, override the guidance generated by the forecasts by Dave Campbell in, uh, in Victoria. And he started letting water out sooner than, than, than the operating plan said that he should. So he was smart enough to realize where things were going and he, and he, could, see, he could see what was happening on the ground and he overrode the system to make, the, make matters not as bad as they would have otherwise been. Okay, so uh, I, I, here's my question, uh, and it may be a naive thing, but um, is anybody uh, going to model what would be uh, the impacts, the flooding impacts, if all the structures were simply removed? Yeah, yeah, that's one of those studies where, where um, um, <clears throat> um, we, we want to look at, um, so one, one of the issues that, 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 that that this advisory committee and I talked about was the fact that there's a great, there's, there's, there, there's this complacency amongst the population about how much flood control they actually get. And the, and the expectation is that, that um, you know, we control the system pretty much 100%. So everybody with docks and marinas around the lake, they, they have come to expect that the lake level will vary only within a very narrow range of three, four feet. And um, it used to vary more than that. Um, if we took those lakes, if we took those dams out, then, 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 then we'd see. So that is something that we want to look at to demonstrate to people how valuable the system has been um, and, and how they actually rely on, on, on the system and, and how lucky everybody is that lives close to water to have that system in place. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's something that, 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 that we uh, talked about and is included in one of those studies. 
Okay, yeah, because that would be, like, be a really interesting starting point, you know, to say, here's what would happen if we didn't have any flow control structures and let the system get back to a, you know, um, a naturalized state, and then to begin, you know, building up from there. Um, but, you know, even uh, with your point to fluctuating lake levels, in even in the Great Lakes, those uh, those lake levels fluctuate a lot uh, over even decadal cycles, right? Because of yeah. the hydrologic persistence and um, a whole bunch of other reasons. So people you know, who own cottages there, including my brother actually, um, they just begin to get used to the fact that, you know, they're gonna have low lake levels sometime and high lake levels. They don't like it, but you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Hey, Peter, was that you trying to make a point? Oh, I was just going to mention that the uh, the Okanagan River portion of the floodplain mapping from 2020, that was with the uh, open gate scenario. So it's not that we remove the dams, but we have the gates open. So that was uh, sort of the yes. worst case. The so that part of the river is close yeah. to what Bernard was uh, mentioning. And with the yeah. forecasting, um, the expectation, I think, is that it's going to become more difficult, even if the forecasting is frequent, it's going to become more difficult to actually forecast with the changing climate. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The, the timing is going to, is, is, is progressively changing. We're already seeing the changes now, but the timing is changing. The mechanisms are, are changing, becoming more, more, more winter and more rain dominant perhaps um, that, than it has been. So yeah. 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 You know, the interesting thing here is that you've got two, Two or three, um, um, two or three situations that that support each other. Um, the 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 the, um, the the need to do something isn't driven only by 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 the fact that the climate's changing. Um, that there, there's 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 no uncertainty that we're polluting the atmosphere and causing uh, warming, but there's definitely uncertainty about. How that is translated into precipitation impacts and and and, and hydrologic changes um, depends on 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 the assumptions that you make going forward out to mid century and end of century. So even if even if even if we don't end up with 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 such huge increases in in um, in, in future flood levels, even if that's the case, the the system is getting old and it's going to need replacing in twenty or thirty years anyway. And the same goes for the restoration benefits. Even if in the worst case, we don't need all that extra channel capacity that the restoration efforts, you know, restoring meander bends and, and moving back dikes are, are gonna provide. Even if we don't need those, those benefits for the OLRS, they're still gonna provide massive environmental benefits just, just through the restoration themselves. So there's multiple inter, interconnecting um, issues here that, 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 that support each other and nothing depends on just one thing. Nothing depends on just one driver. Uh, Brian, I, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, one, one is, uh, uh, I've never been clear what the historic range of salmon was in the system. Uh, did they travel beyond Okanagan Falls into Okanagan Lake? Um, I, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They used to get up through Okanagan Lake and into the tributaries. The, the anadromous uh, sockeye and chinook um, used to get up through Okanagan, through Penticton, through Okanagan Lake and into the tributaries. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Nelson, you can, anybody else who's probably, it's probably people here that know more about it than I do, but Nelson, you're a salmon guy. <laughs> yeah, that's my understanding too, that there's historic records of uh, very large body Pacific salmon being caught right into Cal Lake. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, and then my other question uh, related to the actual the, the report, you mentioned seven years as a timeline, and I, I wasn't quite sure that this, that's seven years to what? Co com complete all the studies that need to be done or was that seven years to do the restorations that needed to be done? No, that's that's seven years to complete this so-called plan of study. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this, this this term plan of study I borrowed from the IJC. They use that uh, term to describe the the program of studies that they needed to undertake before they changed the um, the operating rules for Zozo Dam in 2013. So they they called it a plan of study with they had seven or eight studies. 
So um, we thought it would be a, a good name to apply to this. So it's just seven, it's the seven years applies only to the time required to do all the technical studies and integrate them into developing a plan. And, and the, the biggest, most comprehensive step is gonna be that last one, which we call study 18 in the plan, uh, in, in the report. But that's the one that integrates all the previous work and, and comes up with this optimized plan going forward that brings all the information from all the previous studies together yeah, and, 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 and involves lots of people, uh, scientists and, 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 and um, uh, engineers and, and uh, all of society uh, and, and a whole bunch of stakeholders. Um, and, and we come up with a um, um, plan to, to significantly upgrade, modernize, change the system and the way it's managed that um, you know, reflects the things that we value today. Yeah, well, I just hope I'm uh, I'm still around to see this <laughs> actually happen. Uh, there's a uh, a small project on the section of river between the Penticton Dam and Skaha Lake that's uh, undergoing right now. Uh, a a uh, cut has been made through the dike, and there's a new wetland being developed, and it's absolutely fabulous to see what's going on and the amount of planting of native species into the wetland. Uh, you can just see this thing transforming in front of your eyes. So I, I, you know, I find that really exciting. And that's just one small project, but to see that expand, that would be just, just such a good story. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, Curious, Brian. Uh, this is John here. Hi, John. Uh, as you were talking about the last stage of the planning and optimization. Um, is it being conceived of as, as an optimal plan that then sets something out you're going to follow for the next 30 years? Or is it kind of like an adaptive process of ongoing revisiting of uh, the social values and the concerns as they evolve too over time? Uh, well, it could be like the last step is 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 a plan to 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 just to modernize the system. The work itself would take place over you know many years after that. There'd have to be some land acquisition. You know, it's it's going to cost multi millions of dollars. Um, there's going to have to be some land acquisition. Uh, there's going to be multi millions spent on 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 um, on detailed engineering design and construction. Um, there's going to be tons of of of, of detailed um, you know, environmental and scientific studies. So, so that, that just ends up at, 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 a, at a plan um, that seems like a good way going forward. But that plan should include something that, like you're talking about now is, a, is an adaptive mechanism and, um, or a mechanism for, 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 for learning and adaptive management, I would think. You know, that we haven't gone that far to think about what, what would be in that plan, just that we need to do all this technical work and then develop that, that comprehensive plan. So the contents of that comprehensive plan really still have, you know, ha haven't, not, not much thought has gone into it. This is just the tiny baby step one of, you know, kind of thinking about what we know and what we don't know and, and what we should do to fill in those knowledge gaps before we do anything uh, major. You know, Sean is still continuing to incrementally improve the information that underlies his decision-making on an ongoing basis. Some of those those supporting studies, um, like improving the forecasts that come from the River Forecast Center, Dave Campbell that runs the River Forecast Center is 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 doing that right now. Um, groundwater work. Uh, there could be some more groundwater work done because that groundwater inflow below Penticton influences how much he can he can let out, and he doesn't quite. He wishes he knew more about groundwater right now. Um, the fish water management tools, um, you know, continuously need needs tweaking and improving. So that's another one. So. So there's all sorts of things that are just ongoing normally that Sean will, 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 will do and continue to do. But here we're talking about the major changes, you know, dam removals or, or dam or, or changes or, or channel, uh, channel changes, removing constrictions, uh, uh, reconnecting meander bends and, and, you know, major, major things, spawning beds and, 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 and replanting riparian areas and major, major changes. Thank you. Uh, one small question, and then I'll shut myself off. Those returns of salmon, where are they spawning in the system? 
um, um, the main spawning area is um, um, in the natural or semi-natural state between McIntyre Dam and um, uh, partway down to Oliver. Um, but that's not the only one. They've since, um, <clears throat> so the, the ONA has, uh, um, um, well, since, since, since the uh, OK Falls Dam, the fish ladder was reactivated, there, there, there might be some spawning. I'm not certain of this, but there might be some spawning nor north of Vaso in the channel there. Um, um, and um, uh, they, they've, that, that third major ORI project involves spawning beds. They've constructed five uh, big spawning beds in the Penticton Channel, and they're quite big. They're like 100 meters long or 150 meters long, and there's five of them in that spawning channel. So they've, they've added, um, um, they've added uh, spawning habitat up there. But I don't know. Other somebody else might want to comment more on that. There, there's 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 more salmon experts around here than than than, than, than what I am. Nelson maybe. Lauren, Lauren jumped in there too. I see. That he's saying there's shore spawn sockeye. Well, shore spawn as well. Well, also, I mean, some of the tribs are are major systems like Shuttleworth and Shingle. Um, you know, see some significant volumes of, of fish in the system. And I think what's super exciting now and just recently is that there's all these tribs in Okanagan Lake, um, Mission Creek for sure, but you know, White Man Creek, uh, Trout Creek, all of them have significant potential. And so I think that's, that's, that's part of the vision that needs to, to happen as we move forward is, is figure out how we can get some of these, you know, non main stem components uh, rehab rehabilitated and reestablished to be able to support uh, more fish, fish production. But I, I wish Carrie was still here because that section yeah. below Oliver or above Oliver produces a significant amount of the entire sockeye for the whole Columbia, that little yeah. section. Yeah. And I can't remember, but it's a staggering number. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's huge. There's only one other river, um, there's only one other tributary to the Columbia that ha has anything left. Um, so, Scott, that's the spawning. It's the spawning. That's the limiting in the whole system. It has, yeah, the elimination wow. of spawning and, and, and dams. But now that the dams have been fixed, the next is the spawning habitat. Correct. Like the, the actual gravels. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I heard numbers on the order of 80% uh, came up to the Okanagan for spawning. And that's why uh, some of the, the funding for the Ori project came from south of the border. In, in mm -hmm. fact, a pretty significant amount of it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the funding came from the, the, the Douglas County Public Utility District and the Grant County Public Utility District. They, they, those, those, those PUDs run um, dams. The Wells Dam is run by the Douglas County PUD, which is uh, Wenatchee or East Wenatchee to be more precise. So that's that that's a hydro uh, hydro power dam for East Wenatchee, and um, they have or a a fish hatchery that wasn't um, doing particularly impressively. So they uh, were required to compensate for their fisheries impacts by the U.S. government. So they were persuaded to um, to to contribute significantly to the uh, first project, which was the fish water management tools. And so they provided the bulk of the funding, or, or a big, big part of the funding, anyway, um, to, to, to developing that fish water management tools um, model, and uh, extremely successful, far cheaper and far more effective than than the hatcheries that they were trying to uh, the hatchery they were trying to run.